So my name is Marcy Shapiro and I'm with the Solidarity Committee of the Americas, which is the sponsor of this coffee hour. And we are a committee of women against military madness um, and WHAM. And for those of you who are out of town, WHAM is a Minnesota organization, as is SCOTA, but we do stuff that affects the whole country and the whole world. So um, what I'd like to do is just for people in the room, if you have any questions about anything in the room or anything, I'm going to have Robin raise, her, raise your hand. And, you know, you can go and ask Robin, like, where the bathroom is and where <laughs> anything <laughs> is. So, um, Robin is the director here at WAM, yeah. so that's she knows where the bathroom so is. she knows where the bathroom is and everything else. So, um, so we're, I want to welcome you to this coffee hour. The coffee hour is basically to look at how the U.S. impact on elections in Latin and South America, and particularly we're focusing on the three elections this year in 2024 that um so one of them has already happened in el salvador there's one in june in mexico and there is a third one we don't know when it's going to be in venezuela so um <clears throat> i would like to introduce terry Matson, who's going to frame what this uh, coffee hour is about and we'll be introducing the other speakers and there's Terry on the screen for those who are on Zoom and, and um, so Terry um, was it your fourth grade teacher? No, my sixth grade that, teacher my sixth grade teacher introduced me to, Latin, to Mesoamerican um Cultures, archaeology, yeah. Oh, great. Great. And so her teacher introduced her, and then Terry took off and is one of the most knowledgeable people I know about uh, Latin America and South America. And um, she's the she was the Latin American coordinator for Code Pink, and she hosts um, a YouTube and, and, and podcast called WTF is going on in Latin America. <laughs> Terry's taking a little break, but she will be back soon, I hope. Um, since I'm a big fan of that podcast, I learned so much from it. So I would urge people what I'm going to do, but um, that you. Uh, listen, because I've learned about so many countries and Terry brings in wonderful um, people to speak. And Terry, to Cuba, Ecuador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. Argentina and, and Colombia also. also. Oh, okay. Argentina and Colombia. I don't have that on my list. Okay. And she intended the presidential inaugurations, the recent ones, the last uh, official election observer in Nicaragua, Honduras, and Venezuela. So with that, I'm going to turn the coffee hour. Well, so thank you, Marcy, for the introduction. Uh, I appreciate uh, your support for me and my work. And I will just explain to the audience that I, I have home in my, my work has typically been the last three years been based out of Mexico City, which is how um, I've come to know one of our speakers today. Uh, but I have been home since in California since September, uh, helping uh, my aging parents were transitioning their life. And that is almost complete. And so I'm thankful to you, Marcy, for keeping me in the loop with my 
activism. I'm very, very appreciative to have this um, invitation to speak with all of you today. We have a terrific um, theme to discuss with two really wonderful journalists, activists, attorneys. You're gonna, I think you're gonna really appreciate the knowledge that uh, an experience everyone's gonna share with you uh, this morning. So, so thank you again. I do have my coffee too, folks. So, <laughs> it's, um, but none of those great donuts that you're eating there. Okay, so, <laughs> so good morning, everybody. And I'm really, um, I'm really uh, pleased and thankful for the invitation uh, to be part of today's coffee hour. I'm thankful to you, Marcy, for keeping me in the activist loop as I have been um, attending some family uh, aging parent issues actually since uh, in California since September. So I'm thankful for um, for the opportunity to, to um, work with all of you this morning. So what uh, we're gonna talk about today are three specific elections uh, one that occurred in El Salvador and two that are upcoming. Uh, but let me just, and this is in Latin America and the Caribbean, sorry. So let me just, there's some, a lot of reverberation. Is that me or? Is that okay? So yeah. let me just tell all of you what is happening uh, this year in Latin America and the Caribbean. On February 4, they had presidential elections in El Salvador. We're gonna hear from Andrea uh, about those elections, um, how they proceeded and the, res and the results. Uh, May 5, Panama. Uh, May 19, Dominican Republic. June 2nd, Mexico. Uh, Jose Luis Granados from Mexico City is gonna to talk to us uh, about the run up to those presidential elections. October 27, Uruguay, first round, November 17, second round. Uh, and I'll just throw in there, uh, North America, United States, November 5. And um, in Venezuela, there will be uh, elections 20 in 2024. Uh, the Venezuelan constitution requires presidential elections uh, each six years. The last was held May 2018. I was an election observer May 2018 in Venezuela, I did bring a small group of independent journalists uh, down to Venezuela for those elections. And then there is talk that there may possibly be uh, presidential elections uh, in Haiti. So that's the, um, mm -hmm. the comp composition mm -hmm. of presidential elections uh, in the hemisphere this year. And today we will specifically talk about El Salvador, Mexico, and Venezuela. And one of the things I would like to just uh, share with you, I think all of you know, people throughout the Americas, this year will be voting in the context of a, what is becoming a, a violently emerging multipolar world. I think most of us have seen this multipolarity emerging for the last 20, 30 years, and it's becoming really, really disruptive in this moment. We see conflict in Ukraine. We see genocide in Gaza. We see the U.S. threatening war with China, Russia, Iran. Um, we're seeing a greater U.S. military presence in Latin America, including Argentina, Ecuador, and Peru. Being in the context of failing international institutions, such as the World Health Organization, in the United Nations. So it's an important year. Also, I just want to share with you, because some of you in the room, Simon, you specifically, um, I'm not sure who else is in the room. I think, Sarah, you and I have met in Venezuela uh, for elections. Sarah Martin, I mm -hmm. think I saw you on the mm -hmm. Zoom. Um, let me just remind all of you how, how many elections happened throughout uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Three, October 2020, we saw uh, presidential elections in Bolivia that returned the MAS to power. And um, we have somebody on Zoom today who is in Bolivia now, Christian. So, And uh, there were a slew of um, <laughs> elections. I mean, it, they were presidential elections, um, uh, legislative elections, 
all the way through uh, last fall ending in Argentina, which did not, which dramatically changed the composition of Argentina. But I will say in general, the elections that occurred October 2020 through 2023, I was fortunate enough to be in, oh my gosh, probably half a dozen countries over that three-year period as an election observer and also as a human rights observer. Mm -hmm. What the elections resulted in were people voting for national national sovereignty, preserving national sovereignty, anti-globalism, natural resource sovereignty, and economic plans that Economic plans are a wide spectrum, everything from centrist to, you know, left of center to revolutionary um, economic plans. So it will be interesting to see if that trend continues uh, with these elections this year, if there are setbacks like we saw in Argentina in uh, last fall. Or what starts emerging because people in 2024 are, are voting under a much more volatile international context than in the previous three years. So with that, I want to introduce to you uh, Andrea uh, Palumbo. And she is an attorney in Minneapolis. She's a member of the National Lawyers Guild. Um, she was on a delegation to El Salvador and it was her second trip as an election observer. She's an accredited international election, election observer with CISPISH, which is a committee in solidarity with the people of El Salvador. Uh, and I will say, Andrea, I'm so thrilled that our mutual friend, um, Alexis, who was the um, executive director of CISPISH uh, for the audience, uh, really uh, put all of us in touch to to have you speak today. It was really very exciting how this all came together. I'm so thankful that uh, um, you had time to to join us today, live and in person in Minneapolis. <laughs> so I want to um, hand the floor over to Andrea because she uh, um, yeah she's got the real coffee and donuts today. Um, <laughs> So she was in El I hand the floor over to uh, Andrea so she can share with you her experience in El Salvador and what uh, and what uh, the region an, uh, anticipates to unfold um, since um, these elections in, in El Salvador. Um, my name is Andrea Palumbo and I'm here in Minneapolis with the coffee and donuts. I'm sorry you're all missing out on that. Um, they're really good. <laughs> I was in El Salvador uh, for their last elections on February 4th, and those were the presidential elections and the legislative assembly elections. Um, El Salvador has a one, they have a unicameral legislature, so they only have one house. Um, and it was my second trip to El Salvador. The first time I went was about 10 years ago, and it was for the municipal elections. And the vibe this time was incredibly different. Um, at the time I went in 2012, the FMLN, the, the party of the left, was in power. And, and that election was pretty much between two parties. It was the left and the right, FMLN and ARENA. Uh, with, uh, with the majority, it was... Uh, uh, it was close, but it was a very, very different feeling this time around. Um, the stakes, I have some some pictures of some newspapers. Um, I took these pictures a couple days before the election, and the black and white picture says El Salvador is in its worst moment for transparency in the fight against corruption. Um, now, on the other side, the color one says the government is asphyxiated the opposition to, um, to, to negate the base for the campaign. Basically, the government's strangling the opposition, um, which is exactly is what ha what's happening. Uh, Nayib Bukele is the president of El Salvador right now. Um, he's young, um, comparatively speaking. And he's come from comes from a background in public relations, and he is very skilled in that area. It's it's clear 
Theater. He's very, very good at public relations. Um, he should not have been able to run flat out um, in consecutive term, and the Constitution of El Salvador expressly prohibits that. Now, that's in a lot of constitutions in Latin America that people cannot serve consecutive terms. Um, he's been playing a long game. Um, back in 2019, he was elected in 2019, I should say. But that's when he started solidifying his power. He uh, basically fired the Supreme Court and replaced the judges in El Salvador, where they're called magistrates, with people who are favored him, who are in, in, in basically favored by him. And they will basically follow his lead no matter what. Um, he used them to find a way to run for president again. Um, and they, they complied. Um, I'm not exactly sure how he pulled that off. I was in the Constitution that allowed him to do it. I've heard that he, they just interpreted the Constitution in a way that let him pull that off. But he basically changed the Constitution so that he could run again. Um, he's very popular. He's And... He's charismatic. I gotta grant him that. Um, his claim to fame is that he crushed the gang problem, and that is that's really nothing nothing to to discount. The, the gang problem in El Salvador was horrible. It was uh, for a time it had the highest homicide rate in Latin America, possibly in the world. I'm not positive on that. Um, so he did solve the gang problem, but um, he did it in a way that has really crushed civil and human rights. Um, there are at least 60,000 people incarcerated right now for supposedly being in gangs. Um, um, they are not, their cases are not being heard. Um, they're not, not seeing lawyers. They're not being treated well. Um, right now it's about 70,000 people total who are, who are, and some of them are families of gang members. Some of them are political opponents. Some of them are people who are just getting swept up in these arrests. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. That's 70,000 of a population. Of... I think it's about 6 million. Does that sound right to you, Terry? Yeah. If that. Yeah. And, and one third living in the United States. Yeah, six million, yeah. if that, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, five, six million. The state itself, I'm sorry, the, the country itself is about the size of Massachusetts. It's small. Mm -hmm. um, it's really quite small. And it's very densely populated. Um, so we, we know we know people are ending up in jail and they shouldn't be. Um, well, Kelly was able to to accomplish what he accomplished because he put a state of exception in place, mm -hmm. which is basically imposing martial law. And that's something that is intended to be temporary, kind of like our, our um, oh, what am I looking for? What, what Waltz did during COVID. Um, those were temporary and they had to be renewed and approved by the legislature. Um, but Bukele has put the state of exception in place um, for two years, okay. and it's just continually removed. He has a continually renewed route. He's got a super majority in Congress. He has no opposition. Um, he really didn't need to cheat in this election, but he did. <laughs> and it's really astounding how he did. So what did I see when I was there? Um, I saw a lot of soldiers. Uh, um, this is really unnerving. This, this isn't my picture, but it could have been um, on any, from the day I, we got there, I got there on the January 27th street, soldiers everywhere. It was, you probably see six to eight on every block. We, we went to the, to a park, um, the park at Ecuscatlan where the leaves and mm -hmm. pieces, and we saw dozens of soldiers just kind of around the perimeter, um, just really making their presence known. We, we saw a couple instances where they were stopping people on the street. Um, 
stopping them, searching them. So there was really a huge military presence. It was incredibly creepy. <laughs> so I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective here. Um, these are, this is the state legislature. Um, and this is the elections in 2019, I believe. No, this is the, the 80, there, it was 29, 20, 20, 20, 10 years ago was the one on the left. And 2019 is the one on the right. And FMLN is the red party. You can see them. So they basically hung on through 2019, but Bukele's party is Nueva Cideas, and they're the light blue. And you can see that they just got bigger and bigger. Um, Bukele started with mm -hmm. the FMLN. He was the mayor of uh, San Salvador, which is a very, very high profile position. And he was, he left the FMLN. He says he left, he was kicked out um, <laughs> due to ethics violations. He was, um, being divisive in the party. And he said, fine, I'm going to start my own party with new, new ideas, <laughs> nuevas ideas. And that's really him. new things that El Salvador is going to be looking away from the past, looking forward. So this is what happened, we think, <laughs> this election, you can see the FMLN is completely out of the picture. They have no seats in the legislature. You can also see that instead of 84 seats, there's now 60 mm -hmm. because um, some legislative, um, they lost seats because Bukele combined, he re basically redrew the map of the country. Um, the, the different electoral areas are called, called departments or depart departamentos, and he reduced the number of votes. Um, so it was easier for a large party to get a majority with fewer seats. And he's also um, reduced the number of municipalities, which is kind of similar. Um, it's kind of one step down from departamentos get this, from 262 to 83. So, and, and this has all been done to some degree. They've changed laws. In other instances, they just ignore them, which is really, really disturbing. Um, mm -hmm. So this was probably done greatly with the help of those justices, the magistrates that he replaced, right? They just rubber <laughs> stamped it. Uh, did, did the folks on Zoom hear the question? Yes, you can repeat it. Yeah, the question, the question, really good question. Um, this, the redistricting and the reduction in departamentos and municipalities, was it done with the approval of the magistrates? Yes. Okay. Yep, the approval of the magistrates, approval of the legislature. They, oh, this was a plan. <laughs> he, this started yeah. way back in okay. 2019. Right. Um, and we're, we're in the middle of, of what is probably going to be a long game. It's, it's, I'm trying to figure out what on earth he wants. It's obvious he wants power and he's got power. Um, he's already wealthy. The, the country, the, the economy is more or less controlled by 14 families. Um, they're called the oligarchs. He's not in that club yet. So possibly he wants to get in there. It's really hard to say, but um, he's got, he was described to me as a successful Trump. Mm. And that's a successful <laughs> Trump. Yeah. And that's really the danger. This is this is what <laughs> someone <laughs> this is what <laughs> someone can pull off. Trump. Trump oh, as Trump, in yeah. that guy. <laughs> yeah, this is what this is it's possible to do this. He basically has has the the country in his fist. Um now here's the they may be kind of hard to read. Um, his party got 82, 83%. He was declaring victory before all the votes were counted. Um, the way El Salvador does its elections, um, they are on paper. And the ballots, honestly, they look like a big placemat or a menu. And this is actually really smart. People can vote by um, party or they can vote 
by checking off people. There's pictures, mm -hmm. there's a, a party logo and pictures of all the people running with under that party. And it's really good because a lot of people in El Salvador aren't literate. So that is a way to get everybody at the point where they can vote. Um, so what I was doing, I was sitting in a classroom in a school. Um, they divide a uh, voting district up into to different, um, they're called J JRVs or juntas. That sounds terrible, but <laughs> it means group. Um, and... They are checked off a list. Their identity is checked. You do have to use who they say they are. They give them a crayon. This is important. They give them a crayon to mark their ballot. And they can uh, put an X on the person's face, which is really weird. If you drive through El Salvador, there's campaign pictures of people with big Xs <laughs> through their faces. Um, you can vote by party, straight party line, vote individually. Then you take the ballot, fold it, fold it up into fours, and put it in a ballot box and give your crayon back. <laughs> you always have to give the crayon back. They will chase you down. Um, and when they count the ballots, as an observer, they would count it and they would hold up the ballots so we can see. So they would dump all the ballots on a table, unfold them one by one, and hold them up so we could see the results. Um, the room I was in, we were maybe halfway through the presidential votes when he went ahead and declared victory. Mm -hmm. And he was saying he, he won by 85% of the vote. Um, in some areas, votes than there were people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and while we were counting, we heard these fireworks. So he, had, he, he declared victory before the results were in. And he has been like the forward-looking president, the tech president. The idea was that they would take all these results and upload them so that they could be um, tallied instantly. Um, so they hooked up the computers and they went to upload them in the room where I was. There was no internet. Um, we lost power at one point. Um, we lost power. So no internet, no electricity for a while. Um, even when... The internet was set up, and this was only with the presidential results. Um, the results kept getting timed out. They would hit the send button and the results would time out. And what would they do? They'd hit send again. So we know that duplicate votes were <laughs> sent um, through to be tabulated. So, but he got 82%, FMLN got six, Arena got about six. Um, and those were really the main parties in play. Um, I've got a question. Sure. Of course. And you might be getting to this. It sure looks like the people in the opposition should just stay at home. That's what we are thinking. Yeah. Are, are not happy with them to stay home. They they figured why bother. Um, I wish I had gotten a picture of this. Um, some some people in things on the ballot, and someone had had put X's on all of them, so the vote didn't count anyway. But they had drawn a picture of Bukele with devil's horns. <laughs> And so there was definitely some opposition happening. Um, the Legislative Assembly was a different story. Um, the room I was in, they got it together. They knew, they really knew what they were doing. Um, other rooms in the school, I was wandering around, they had no clue. Um, with the Legislative Assembly, they, they, they gave up counting the votes around midnight because they just couldn't get them transmitted and uploaded. They got tra transmitted. And there was no reason to expect that it was accurate. Mm. We also had kind of very typical voter fraud things happening where a bunch of ballots went missing. Um, El Salvador is the largest voting 
area, the largest departamento in the state, and those votes have vanished. So the votes for the, for the capital were gone for a while. Um, we found, we heard about boxes of ballots found in warehouses. Um, <laughs> no idea how they got there. Um, so the, the legislative assembly, it was obvious the legislative assembly vote could not be trusted. So they, did, they started a recount. And this was just a flashback back to Florida <laughs> where they, they took over a hotel and just dumped out ballots and people counted them, looked at them by hand, one by one, just surrounded by election observers. Um, and the election was on the 4th and they finally finished counting, um, I think on the 16th. And, and the opposition parties are calling for the election to be overturned and null. There's, they, and this, I mean, you've got all of the opposition parties working together, which never happens. They're, the left and the right are saying, you have to redo this. These results have to be thrown out. We have no faith in the results. Um, and the Supreme Electoral Authority and the Supreme Court are saying, no, we're not going to do that. At least that's what they're saying now. Um, I have two itty bitty quotes on here. Um, the top one is from the Secretary of State where they are congratulating Naive Bukele on his electoral victory. This was before the presidential re results were finalized. And the United States com commends the work of electoral observers yay, and looks forward to working with President-elect Bukele and Vice President Felix Uyola following their inauguration in June. The United States values our strong relationship with the people of El Salvador. <laughs> Events in El Salvador have a direct impact on U.S. interests. Mm -hmm. Only by working together can we achieve our full potential. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get this quote below. And if you want me to mail, mail you my slides, I'll be more than, more than happy to. So, um, how much? About two more minutes. Okay. Oh, yeah. that's great. I'm almost okay. done. Good. Um, okay. I just want to check in. <laughs> <laughs> um, before the election, you might have seen that Ilhan Omar and other senators sent a Dear Colleague letter raising concerns about the elections in El Salvador and the U.S. relationship with El Salvador. Um, this statement is from the same people. We congratulate the people of El Salvador and those in the Salvadoran diaspora who exercised their democratic right to vote over the weekend. Mm -hmm. While they exercise their, I'm paraphrasing, while they exercise the right to vote, we are troubled by the unconstitutional moves that strongly influence the outcome of Sunday's election and statements by the vice president about eliminating and replacing democracy. He has said, he, he walked it back, but he did say that we are going, we are, we are here to eliminate and dismantle democracy and replace it with something new. Um, while we acknowledge the government's progress on combating violent crime, we remain concerned about weakening transparency and oversight mechanisms and the rapid undermining of the rule of law and human rights protections. Um, what I saw was a huge step backwards. It really was. Um, in 10 years ago, we met a lot of people who were participating in literacy programs, and community health programs, community education programs, those are all gone. Um, the justification has been to save money. Um, the Bukele has made it clear that he is not acknowledging the past. He's tearing down the history of El Salvador. Um, he's been casting himself as some one knew he called the 1992 peace accords a farce. He's constantly casting the opposition parties as corrupt, corrupt dinosaurs. Um, so he's he's very clearly um, basically dismantling all of the progress that has come from the 1992 peace accords. Yep. So can I ask? What exactly was it? The gang problem that sort of distracted the FMLF? We wait till the end. Yeah, no, I'm basically done. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, you we, want to we get the other two presentations. I'll, I'll answer your question real quick. And, and, and is yeah. the, are U.S. intelligence agencies involved in any way in any of this, the stabilization? I don't think we have to, to be totally honest. Um, the question was, what happened? Is, is the U.S. intelligence involved, intelligence involved in destabilization? And what was the FMLN just not equipped to deal with the gangs? That's part of it. Oh, I think a right. big, and, and the problems I think are, are really, they go, they go back a ways. I think the FMLN, they were one side in the civil war. They weren't exactly equipped to become a political party. I see. So okay. they, they, they lost some ground and they haven't, I hate to, I don't want to dump on them because they've done wonderful work, but they have not really been connected with the popular movements mm -hmm. on the ground. And that is where progress is going to come. Okay. Thank you. So that is my very quick overview. Um, there's a wonderful article um, on the Jacobin webpage written by Hillary Goodfriend. She was on the delegation with me. Just a very good description and overview of, of basically the fraud that's been going on since 2019. Thank you. Well, thank, so thank you, Andrea. Wow. We could we we should have you do a presentation just a full hour on on what you saw. And see what you, well, no, seriously, because it's going to be really important to see the you know how this influences the at certainly the rest of Central America and possibly the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. Yeah. You know, it's really. really and how that all plays out is going to be really fascinating. This was, I think, better. Terry was just saying there's been a generational shift, and yeah, absolutely. it'll be fascinating. Absolutely, it's really clear to influence and affect Central America, mm -hmm. and you know, perhaps ripple out. Can I can I just say a couple things regarding El Salvador before I introduce our next speaker? Uh, I don't know how many of you know that Bukele was in Washington, D.C. earlier in the week. I think Thursday he spoke at CPAC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, he was uh, welcomed as an enormous celebrity. He gave a 24-minute speech. You can find that on YouTube. He does talk about uh, gangs and being an anti-globalist government. He goes into a lot of other things, too. Uh, and like Andrea said, he's very, he comes from... Uh, a um, PR background, and it's really, really clear when he speaks that he's very charismatic. He knows exactly what to say and how to say it. And um, it's worth listening just to kind of get a, you know, who he is and what he plans to do going forward. And then I just also want to um, mention with and really the opposition in, in El Salvador or the opposition is to the left. Uh, it's November 2021 for those presidential elections. And one of the things that was really, really clear, and this is just a generalization of opposition parties, those of us being focused, you know, center and center left, is that the strategy that Libre used in Honduras, and it took them 12 years to take their movement into mm -hmm. a political party, was to win by, by a super majority throughout the country in Absolutely. all the seats, not community, could in no way contest the electoral results. And that, unfortunately, is, is uh, a variable that, you know, needs to happen. So anyway, um, with that, <laughs> I'm just, I really want to introduce our next speaker because Mexico is a, is a really perfect example <laughs> of taking, of creating a third party and take building a movement, it, building a third party political party out of a movement that was created, I think 14 plus years ago, and taking that movement into a political party and winning elections uh, throughout, you know, at the at the state and federal level. And so um, I want you all to meet my good friend, Jose Luis Granados. 
and he's joining us from Mexico City today. He is a writer and podcaster with Venezuela Analysis. He's an editor at the Mexico Solidarity uh, Media, Mexico, which is a pro- which is part of the Mexico Solidarity Project. He and I work together uh, on Mexico Solidarity Media. Uh, he writes a monthly opinion column for the Mexico Solidarity Project Bulletin. He also serves as the co-host of the podcast Sobonaria, the Mexican politics podcast. And I think you host that with Kurt Hackbarth. It's for English speaking audiences to better understand Mexico, the politics and players from a leftist perspective. And um, he, this is really exciting. He is currently finishing a master's degree in the defense and promotion of human rights at the university uh, the Autonomous University uh, of Mexico City, and his participation in this graduate oh. or master's program is a direct result mm-hmm. of the current government's um, programs and policies. So with that, welcome Jose Luis. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to, he- to be here with you, uh, to have heard that great uh, presentation around El Salvador. Um, Seems unfortunately it doesn't get a lot of attention and they're kind of flying under the radar when it comes to pretty blatant human rights abuses, speaking of the topic. And now that this blatant electoral fraud, um, I also put it in the chat for those of you who are connected to Zoom, that article that was mentioned by Hillary Goodfriend. Uh, she lives in or works here in, in Mexico, but law, lived and worked in, for a very long time in El Salvador. It's a really, really good report. Mm-hmm. Kind of really puts it all in, in one place. I uh, highly recommend it to, for people to check it out. But yeah, I'm here to talk about Mexico. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm always happy to be able to take uh, the opportunity to do this. I actually just got back from speaking to her. I went in person uh, to a number of cities on the West Coast, following up on a coast, East Coast tour as well. Um, and it's part of the efforts of the Mexico Solidarity Project. Maybe that's where I'll begin. So the Mexico Solidarity Project began in 2019. I didn't get involved myself personally until 2021. But basically the effort is to reach out to people like yourselves, um, the English speaking world, but also uh, the Spanish speaking world, recognizing that there are many um, Latino, Latine, uh, Mexican uh, people living in the United States uh, who still have uh, Spanish as a, as a first language. So uh, our, our, basically our effort is to build people-to-people solidarity between those of you in the United States and those of us here in Mexico. Because I think, uh, as Terry said at the very beginning, what's happening in Mexico, um, frankly, is worthy of inspiration. And I think a lot of people can take a lot of positive um, notions from it, but also some lessons in terms of uh, what it looks movement, turn that movement into a party, that that party uh, be able to win the uh, state power, uh, the government via elections, via democratic elections, uh, and then be able to actually consolidate that process of transfer, transformation in a country uh, to be positioned to be able to further it, to deepen it, um, as we hope will happen this year with elections and the incoming government of Claudia Scheinbaum. So um, I'm assuming most people probably know a thing or two about Mexico, but I'll just uh, mention a couple of things. One of the things we always say at the Mexico Solidarity Project is that 2018, the election of López Obrador with uh, 52% of the vote, um, a landslide victory, uh, constitutes a watershed moment for the country. There's a beginning, uh, there's a before and there's an after as a result of his election in 2018. Um, And I think precisely because it could serve as an inspiration, a lot of people don't really know too much about what's happening in Mexico, the fact, the fact that it's such a big country, it's a major economy, it's part of the G20, it's an OECD country. It, it is the now, it actually, very, the last year, displaced trading partner of the United States. Um, you know, we share a very long border, we have a very deep bilateral relationship, um, but a lot of people don't know about Lopez Obrador. And in fact, um, unfortunately, what we see is just a lot of left criticism mm-hmm. Um, saying that he hasn't gone far enough or that he's not really a leftist president. Um, I refute that completely. I think if you actually look at what's happening inside the country, it is um, far and away one of the clearest examples of the a reconfiguration, the correlation of forces, the balance of forces in favor of the working class, the marginalized, the oppressed, the campesinos in this country. Um, why do I say that? Uh, I think we could look at sort of some of the more obvious points. Um, you know, oh, it's Lopez Obrador is about to finish his his term, and we can see a massive drop in poverty. Um, so poverty is now um, there are nine million less people living in poverty today than there were a year ago. 
uh, kind of that speaks to the impact of his social programs. The social programs is kind of a rescuing of that old um, left tradition of building need-based programs, bringing those back uh, um, and uh, through, for example, the most popular one is the monthly stipend uh, that is universal. So there are basically all you have to do is sign up, and you know, as long as you're of a certain age, and you will receive that that um, that pension. Uh, that's particularly important in a country like Mexico, where there is so much informal employment, and so many people uh, were never actually able to uh, have enough savings or actually be able to benefit from uh, social social security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I always say that it's not a lot of money, but if you talk to people who receive it, it's a life-changing amount of money. They went from, uh, you know, be, be living on the very edge of extreme poverty to now being able to afford their medicines, to be able to go out once in a while to eat healthier food, to uh, expansion of access to education. I myself am attending a university founded by Lopez Obrador when he was mayor of Mexico City, uh, where not only do I not pay a penny in tuition, but I actually receive a monthly stipend. From the government as well, so that I can focus full time on my studies um, to the tune of around fourteen thousand pesos a month, which is actually on average what a professional makes once they finish their um, professional studies. So um, it's it's a very generous scholarship that comes from um, from the state. Um, there's a number of other programs in Brando Vida, which uh, is encouraging um, campesinos to stay in their communities and plant trees. It's also a climate change mitigation effort. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, but there's other kind of big picture things that I think are important that that reinforce um, that thesis of mine that this is a, um, a pro-worker government. Uh, one, there has been a duplication in real terms, so adjusting for inflation of the minimum wage. So for the longest time, when there was the old regime was in power, they would re raise the minimum wage by pennies, uh, arguing that it would increase inflation and that the number one priority is to attain inflation in a country, a developing country like Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think he's proven that that was always fundamentally a, a lie. Uh, and now what we're seeing is a, a dramatic uh, increase in the quality of life of people who previously, um, you know, earned very little through the, as a result of the minimum wage. And as we know, minimum wage, as it rises, it tends to lift all wages in general in, the, in a country. That's one example. Um, the other one would be a labor reform that happened on May Day, on May 1st, 2019, which democratized the country's, um, basically, we call it sindicalismo charro, um, yellow unions, company unions, that um, the way that I always try to frame it is that in Mexico, uh, a lot of things kind of emerged and became institutionalized in the wake of the Mexican Revolution, which was a progressive, was one of the most progressive movements in the 20th century, really kind of only um, outpaced by the subsequent Bolshevik Revolution and the Chinese Revolution and anti-colonial struggles, but you know it was kind of the first of the 20th century. Um, but a system became consolidated, which basically made it so that um, you didn't have democratic representation, but you did have good contracts. But as a result of the basically the neoliberalization of the country's <laughs> politics and economy, that uh, you stopped having. Uh, you stopped having the good wages and the good contracts, but you still had the lack of democracy, so there's nothing you could do about it. So this government, a massive re uh, reform of the uh, laws governing trade unions, forcing them to basically democratize, and that's led to an explosion of, of, of new democratic trade unions. Um, uh, new organizing, they're trying to supervise. Um, you know, Mexico in a lot of ways followed neoliberal doctrines basically since the 80s, uh, basically since the mid 80s with De La Madrid, but really kind of becomes consolidated with Salinas and, you know, following the, 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 the pre and the pan governments that ruled until 2018, until the election of López Obrador. Um, and they presided over the massive privatization of state-owned industries, uh, but a couple of key ones, uh, and these are the ones that foreign capital, U.S. capital in particular, were always most interested in, is the electricity sector and the energy sector, the, the, the hydrocarbon sector. And mm -hmm. so there was creeping privatization happening under the previous government. In comes Lopez Obrador, and he puts an immediate stop to that and actually rescues both the state-owned electricity company, bringing um, the majority of energy production, once again, under the control of the state, now something I think 52% of energy being generated in the country is done by a, the state-owned firm. Um, 
once again, renegotiating the contracts, which actually were privi privileging private producers, making it more electricity more affordable and more accessible, reach, reaching out to communities, using their infrastructure to expand um, internet connectivity, rural communities, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the height of an economy, is the oil company, um, but it was basically being set up to fail, to make it so that um, that, that it was that all oh, well, you know, you know, it doesn't make sense to have state or oil companies refineries that were falling apart. Basically, they purchased a new refinery, Deer Park, inside of the United States, uh, and they built a new one. So the the idea is to aim for energy self sufficiency. Well, and model also. Sorry, uh, energy production in the world. So that's actually a revenue generating role in selling uh, a um, because, as we know, Cuba largely depends on Venezuelan oil in terms of the achievements of the Mexican government under Lopez Obrador. What I would say is, um, is the rescue sovereignty, the central role that sought the, the protection of the national sovereignty plays uh, in, in the country. So I was talking just about, you know, Mexico selling oil to Cuba. So when that criticism is three hours long every day, Monday to Friday, it's like, let's be clear, once and for our sovereign country of why sovereignty is important to hide. And when we look at the, the case of, of Mexico in particular, and, and what I'm studying, what my thesis, the title of my thesis is actual sovereignty of state to actually be able to guarantee the full spectrum, including the economic, social, and cultural rights, which are not often talked about, um, if it has the national sovereignty. So, uh, you know, to the to the extent that a country can human rights, to the extent that it's limited, that it, it is, a, uh, or, or to the degree that a country is uh, in the service, of U.S. imperialism, I think he's on. so. That's the context. Um, see, I know I'm, we're trying to keep it short here, so um, that all sounds very good and well. And uh, I'm happy to report that Lopez Obrador is extremely popular. He commands mm -hmm. um, appro approval ratings of 70, 80 percent, extraordinarily high approval ratings. Um, despite the fact that there are still very serious challenges in this country, namely the issue around migration, the issues around security and, and organized crime groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the population, I think, in general, is pretty patient with him. They understand that this is a qualitatively different government. This that this kind of forgives, um, you know, some of the spaces where perhaps he, the country hasn't made enough progress. Although arguably high number of homicides in this country, um, but for the first time, those are, that. that those numbers aren't increasing. They're actually decreasing slightly, but they're decreasing. Well, the problem is at least not getting worse. Anyway, uh, so Lopez Obrador is incredibly popular. His government is incredibly popular. Uh, you don't actually just have to listen to opinion polls. He's elected in 2018, and subsequently um, has won almost all of the governor three, I think, or four, four that he has uh, so now, out of the 32 federal entities, uh, and really kind of really expanded its territorial, so it proves. I mean, if it wasn't popular, he, the, the party wouldn't be winning elections. Now, here's the clutch: uh, Lopez Obrador is constitutionally prohibited from seeking re-election. In fact, at the beginning, they would always joke, they're like, "Oh, he's going to change the constitution. He's a dictator. He's a, you know, he's just like Hugo Chavez, or blah blah blah." You know, the usual kind of rhetoric gets used against progressive anti-hegemonic governments uh, that he was going to change the, the the constitution. Obviously, he did. He did make a lot of changes to the Constitution, and all of those aggressive elements, the socialist elements of the 1917 Constitution, um, but not just 
and it's candid, it's Claudia Scheinbaum. Claudia Scheinbaum, um, a major institution, uh, the position, the effort to. In, until Lopez Obrador asked her to become uh, when he was mayor of Mexico City. That kind of raised her profile. It's such a big difference to live in a country that's been ruled by uh, um, You know, Terry uh, uh, and the uh, Polytechnic University. So if people who are familiar with with Mexico City, well, government build, uh, build, what are they called? Gondolas. And, and gondolas, uh, there's now the third line being built. And one of them that was that on the weekend, I, I could leave my house, literally across the street. Go that Claudia Scheinbaum built. She built 17 parks in her term, uh, where the Secretary of Culture is putting on a free show. So me and my family can be there in the crowd, and you know maybe we'll bring a picnic and we'll have an incredible evening out. And we didn't spend more than what 50 pesos, maybe three dollars, right? Um, that. That's the quality of life that you can afford when you redistribute wealth through the state. And um, that's just one example. They also built 300, 300. For those of us who may be involved in social services, I used to do that before I became a journalist, 300 youth focused, um, like I mentioned, for example, the scholarships that used to be offered to all children to, to uh, public school here in the city receives um, a subsidy to pay for school supplies, for uniforms, for shoes, all these kinds of things for, for, for lunch, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, that's just an idea of what kind of an approach. One of the things that I always appreciate about Gladys Scheinbaum is that she also uses that rights based language. She says that, no, these are rights. This is an obligation that we have to the population. We have a social debt that we have to attend to. And that's kind of been the framework that she's been doing. And she's now the candidate for Morena. And in a lot of ways, from my uh, opinion, when there were there was a, a number of candidates that were uh, vying to become the candidate of Morena. Uh, and there, but there were basically three who had a real shot at it. And I would say that they had Adana Gusto Lopez, former, in fact, his signage alluded to the fact, que siga Lopez, let Lopez continue because they have to, she had the same last name. Kind of like, if you pick me, it's going to be more of Lopez Obrador's style of foreign affairs secretary. And he kind of represented that shift to the center, an appeal to the middle class, an appeal to kind of more uh, centrist, self-identified centrist, um, to try to uh, you know win the, 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 the candidacy that way. And then there was Claudia Scheinbaum, who arguably was the left candidate, who was like kind of the true left candidate, um, but he um, you know, wasn't ever quite positioned in a place to win, though uh, in interestingly, he was the only one who really um, increased his support um, from the party base throughout this process, whereas the other ones kind of stayed where they were, he actually managed to get some support. Anyway, he's now completely signed on to Claudia Scheinbaum's campaign. So, okay, this is the final thing. I know I've gone a little bit long. Um, Claudia Scheinbaum also is a polling incredibly well. All right? um, the voters of Mexico want to see continuity. They want to continue to support Morena in power. That is clear as day from any opinion poll from the right-wing outlets to the left-wing outlets. They all say the same thing. Well, the only thing that changes is the numbers. But the rival candidate, Xochitl Galvez, from the opposition coalition, so the opposition has um, become they come into a forced marriage, I call it. Um, they don't really like each other, but they're running together and they're presenting a single a single candidate named Xochitl Galvez. She has never been within 20 points of Claudia Scheinbaum. Claudia will pull upwards of 65% support to 20% for Xochitl Galvez. Other ones put her at like 55 to 30. The point is, is that the, the gap is huge. And unless something catastrophic happens, which is very unlikely, it's going to stay that way. 
And now that sounds like really good news. Great. The progressive movement in Mexico is going to uh, consolidate its victory, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the danger. And this is the thing that I think is seldom talked about. And what I really want to emphasize, if you have any takeaway from, from my presentation today, it's this. Because the opposition knows that it can't win, it's going to resort to the sorts of tactics that we've seen in other places in Latin America, where they have been marginalized by the hegemonic, the newly hegemonic party in power. So in the case of Mexico, that's Morena. So when they are put in this position, when they feel cornered, they do a couple of things. One, they retreat into their strongholds. They retreat into positions where, like the private media, the court, uh, to try to kind of attack from that marginalized position and maintain its, uh, you know, its privileges. The other thing it does is conspire. It starts to be they start to act um, undemocratic the candidates. So she got this to a tour in the United States. And who did she meet with? She met with the America Society, Council of the Americas. She met with the Wilsons and other people from the Organization of American States. Then she went to Spain, where she met with that far-right um, Foundation for Liberty, et cetera, et cetera. She's now tied to the Atlas Network. Some of you may know who sort of very, very well, well organized um, with a very tarnished history of interference in processy, political processes in in Latin America. And what they're trying to do now, and if you've been paying attention to the news when it comes to Mexico lately, you've probably seen all of these accusations trying to link Lopez Obrador to organized crime, to try to undermine his government. And actually, this is what, what they're really trying to do, is undermine the legitimacy of Claudia Sheinbaum's election. Because they know they won't win, they're trying to weaken her mandate to the degree that they might even flirt with a coup. How would that play out? They would actually petition so that the election is not recognized under the allegation that the result was a product of interference by organized crime groups. That's a very real danger. Mm -hmm. uh, it all depends on the balance of forces at the time. So, uh, you know, will they feel confident enough to try to play that card? It all depends on what the State Department says. It all depends on who's in power in Washington at the time. Uh, it depends on who are the other regional actors and will they, will they sign up for this strategy. So we know that their effort is, okay, we're not going to win, so let us undermine this government. And they're talking about undermining what will potentially be the first woman president of Mexico, uh, the first Jewish woman president of Mexico. Um, so uh, even though they... Um, this is the scenario. I think it's very important, even though it looks like Morena is well positioned, the polling numbers look like it's going to deliver uh, an overwhelming victory, possibly even bigger than the one that Lopez Obrador got in 2018. There is a danger that there will be interference. So what does that mean for us? Uh, well, that's why the Mexico Solidarity Project exists. We have the Mexico Solidarity Media website, MexicoSolidarity.com. We have the bulletin, which is bilingual. You can sign up and receive information in either English or Spanish. We invite people to uh, also encourage their friends and neighbors and family members to sign up as well. It's kind of where we send uh, information it's once a week, just on, on every Wednesday. Um, you know, one of the founders of the newsletter, it's like a friend coming over for coffee, you know, coming and knocking on your door. Hey, let me, let me talk to you about Mexico for a little while. Um, so that encourages a really good uh, click rate. Uh, like I said, so we have the, the news website as well. Uh, and then we, uh, Kurt Hackbarth and I, we just launched a new podcast. Uh, it's just he and I basically breaking down, analyzing what's happening when it comes to the discussions around Mexico in English language media. Uh, we want to get into a little bit more of other political stuff, but with so many um, outright lies being printed in, in news outlets, including the prestigious New York Times, the most recent report is uh, embarrassing in terms of its journalistic malpractice. I'm a journalist. Uh, you know, I don't say that lightly. I think it was unethical to uh, to have printed the stories that they did. Same thing for the Publica article that, that was done. Um, and anyway, so so in this podcast, we analyze that. I'll put a link in here. Maybe we can share it as well. Um, but it's the Soberania, the Mexican politics podcast. Please encourage you to, to listen and share. Um, it's become an important resources, resource for us. It's coming out on Monday, but we've released a bit around the New York Times. People are interested in hearing more about that. And obviously, we have a, a handful of episodes. Key would be to try to maintain engaged, uh, and ultimately, we may find ourselves in a need. Um, we're trying to put the pieces together to organize a delegation because if there is this effort to try to undermine, to discredit the, 
the, the actual results. It'll be important for people who live and work in the United States to be with us in Mexico, to be able to counter that narrative in their own communities and their own organizations as well, um, because we, you know, this is what we expect. There's gonna be this effort. We've seen it before. Um, you know, I've been doing Venezuela solidarity work for over 20 years now. Um, and that's how it all began, right? If you read an article about Venezuela today, they, they write it as if it's, you know, commonplace knowledge. Oh, Venezuela's a dictatorship, right? Uh, but that was a process, a very long process of consistently undermining faith and confidence in Venezuela's electoral system that they're now able to get away with saying it without actually trying even to bother to substantiate it, even though it can't be, right? Like those of us who've been to Venezuela and have observed elections that can, can speak to its credibility. So this is the strategy. This is what they're trying to apply in Mexico. Um, please uh, keep paying attention. And thank you so much for inviting me to be able to share this with you. Um, I'm more than happy to, uh, to take any questions and I'll put some links in the chat. Maybe we can share those with the people who are in the room uh, uh, as well and enjoy your coffee. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the Times article that uh, Jose was talking about. Yeah. Um, is was today on the front page of the St. Paul Pioneer Press, which is the St. Paul, Minnesota paper. They rarely have foreign policy information on their front page. So it's really, I was really horrified to see it on the front page. But it, it, it's such an example of uh, creating the narrative and and then, you know, spreading it and, and controlling it. And I would argue, Jose Luis, that, you know, this really started like, I think I saw the first article, anti-Morena, anti-AMLO article uh, published by Bloomberg, like in fall of 2021, the, the business environment, U.S. business environment really uh, started creating an anti-AMLO narrative. And, and I would argue that was because they saw that the Morena government is you know, really focused on national sovereignty, natural resource sovereignty, state investment in infrastructure, education, health care versus privatization. And that narrative started, you know, two years ago. And um, and it's just gotten really caustic now. I mean, to the point of, of accusing, you know, the Mexican president of being a narco trafficker, which they did in 2020 to Nicolas Maduro in uh in Venezuela, when uh, William Barr was the attorney general, I don't know how many of you remember that, but he was prosecuted by the United States that over judicial reach of the U.S. prosecuting the, the democratically elected president of Venezuela. So, Jose Luis, is there anything else we should add? You know what I want to tell the people, the, the, the gondola that, that Jose Luis was talking about is called the Cable Bus in Mexico, and he and I keep threatening to do a, what the F is going on in Latin America and the Caribbean, an episode, you know, of how of how that extension of public transportation has, you know, really changed his life when he was living in that part of the city. Um, it's pretty phenomenal what the investment in public infrastructure, transportation especially, can do for people in their daily lives. So um what else should we talk about should we move on to venezuela now is there anything else jose luis that you want to say or no it's good i think maybe um if people have questions i'm more than happy to kind of get it i know it was a lot to throw at people so um it'd be good to to hear from others and then I'll, we'll, we'll respond to that so this was really great how you framed this jose luis to lead into what i would like to talk about and the narrative against venezuela really uh, started, you know, 1998 when Chavez was first elected. And so it took a while for the solidarity movement, and I would argue even the Venezuelan government, to really understand what a media narrative can do, how devastating it is, and how that affects, the, you know, the perception outside the country. And that has since been turned around. But the media campaign... Uh, is is a really uh, devastating thing. And I think a lot of governments today are overtly talking about, uh, and in, when I think we're even seeing it today, particularly with the war in Ukraine, how the media, it's a media war versus, you know, a land intensive war. The war is going to be won, you know, through the media. And so Venezuela was one of the first countries to really suffer that. 
and uh, eventually, you know, came to grasp that it had to be dealt with and the creation of Venezuela and analysis by Greg Wilpert, of which Jose Luis works as well as uh, inside Venezuela to do that. And that was created with the West driven narrative. Anyway, we're talking about an election year. And so I want to, um, the elections in Mexico are June 2nd. And in Venezuela, they have not yet been determined constitutionally. The presidential elections have to happen this year, 2024. They happen every six years. And um, uh, six years ago, May 2018, I was on the ground as an election observer in Venezuela. Uh, and like I said earlier, I brought a delegation of um, independent, progressive, and leftist journalists down to observe the elections. We wanted uh, uh, people on the ground who could present an election result. We knew exactly what the United States, assuming uh, Maduro won. And so we wanted people on the ground, just as Jose Luis is asking all of you to be in Mexico on June 2nd. We took a group down in May of 18 for that exact same purpose. So this year, per the Venezuelan constitution, there has to be uh, presidential elections. And so let me just, I want to back up to October of 2023, where um, there was uh, meetings in Barbados, and we refer to them as our Barbados Accords, or partial agreement on the promotion of political rights and electoral guarantees for all. So after about a year delay, uh, the Venezuelan government and the opposition met in Barbados in October of 2023. There were meetings uh, to talk about lifting of sanctions, structuring the uh, upcoming presidential elections. The talks were mediated by Norway. The principal purpose of those meetings was to lift sanctions, but also uh, the parties laid out uh the basically the the rules of uh, of how they want to see uh, the election proceed in 2024, and so here's what they agreed upon. This is October of 2023. They rejected any political violence against Venezuela or state institutions. They had 12 points regarding the presidential of 2024. That date is still not determined. I believe it'll be determined on Monday, this coming Monday. Um, they're going to update the electoral registry, promote balanced media coverage, uh, publicly recognize the election results, and invite international observation missions. The EU has since been uninvited. Uh, and all candidates are allowed to run. Granted, they do not break the law or the Venezuelan constitution. And there were other things they agreed to as well, uh, as far as um, not uh, as far as pushing to maintain the sovereignty of Venezuela's natural resources and businesses, including um, natural resources, uh, oil shale sitting in the Essequibo. That's a whole nother subject, but that Essequibo is that, that zone between Venezuela and Guyana. And it has uh, enormous uh, shale oil deposits uh, um, to, pro to fight for the uh, preservation of CITCO, which is uh, U.S. bankruptcy court. And so those were the framework that the opposition and the uh, Maduro government uh, came to terms on agreement on in October of 2023. Now, in January, something really related to those agreements happened. And this was, uh, there's a candidate, um, not unlike the right-wing candidate in Mexico. Uh, her name is Maria, Maria Corina Machado. She is a U.S.-backed opposition candidate, not unlike Juan Guaido. Uh, she's right-wing elite. And she believes that she should should be the only opposition candidate um, 
to be running in Venezuela. She has a criminal background. And so given the agreement in Barbados in October, that would, um, you know, preclude her from participating. The government waited uh, for a Supreme Court ruling on her before going forward uh, with the electoral process. And in January, uh, the Venezuela Supreme Court rejected her as, as a candidate. And some of the, one of the, well, I'll give you a few reasons why she was rejected. She participated, organized by uh, stand-up president, you know, Juan Guaido. She has endangered Venezuelan foreign assets. Uh, so basically the, uh, how would you say it? The uh, the reappropriation of Venezuela, uh, Venezuelan assets under Guaido to U.S. and British uh state and government um also uh the colombian based monomeros i hope i'm saying that right which uh is a is an agricultural chemical company including fertilizer and that company uh was sanctioned and the owners were sanctioned from doing business in Venezuela. And she had, she was part of promoting those sanctions. And so imagine a country and promote food sovereignty, not having access to fertilizer for its agricultural development. And so that was interpreted as her as an opposition, you know, candidate, not only supporting U.S. sanctions against Venezuela, but actually attempting to starve her own people. So she's not a kind woman. Uh, she does. So in that regard, she does support U.S. Um, sanctions against Venezuela, and she also has endorsed foreign foreign military intervention to overthrow not allowed to run. And um, this was not unexpected uh, by a by a lot of people. But um, so then, what should I also tell you? So in response to her. Um, disqualification uh, jose luis i think you mentioned this the, the immediate u.s response was to uh sanction venezuela gold mining the mining industry mining sector in venezuela that was immediately sanctioned with the threat of more, more uh, sanctions uh on venezuela at the end of april and those those sanctions uh, asked so this is a really uh, threat there or threat or intervention as to who their political candidates should be and and how the Supreme Court should work and how they determine, you know, who gets to run. So a real threat on the Venezuelan constitution and the sovereignty of the Venezuelan people to uh, run their elections. So I do want to say earlier. Uh, it was uh, earlier this week. Um, the National Assembly, led by Jorge Rodriguez, uh, conducted meetings with 42, 42 political parties in Venezuela. Who knows if Venezuela has 42? Who in the states knows that Venezuela has 42 political parties? <laughs> Probably very, very few of us. Of all political, you know, a full spectrum of politics. So they met, the National Assembly uh, leadership met with these 42 political parties, and, and the result of that was uh, yeah, and, uh, to an agreement that will set the final dates of the presidential elections in 2024, which in Barbados in 2023 were determined to be the last six months uh, of, of this year. So... I do uh, um, I do want to just as a side note say earlier this month uh, I was uh, granted an interview with um, Venezuelan <coughs> Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs for North America, Carlos Ron. I think many of you in the audience may know him. We had an hour long interference in the coming of uh, uh, Venezuelan elections, including the backing of Maria Machado incurring uh, including the threat of additional sanctions and and media 
And uh, that is a, uh, what we did that as a uh, Code Pink radio podcast. And I can share the link with you in the chat. Just, it, it's an hour long. And so it goes into a much more detailed um, conversation about who she is and and how it's such an overt form of U.S. interventionism. I want, if I can, I want to share with you, I'm going to try, uh, I want to share with you uh, a couple things. If I can screen share, I want to show you how Venezuelans vote. Because this too, I think, is perceived uh, uh, by the... Okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I think so. They're all handled the same way. Per the Constitution and uh, uh, in Venezuela organizes and runs um, the elections throughout the country. They are part of the Venezuelan Constitution. It is uh, a body of the Constitution. Not just... So here, juxtaposed to what Andrea saw on election day in El Salvador... This is a polling center, uh, and you'll see the National Guardsmen uh, at the entrance, and all the all the um, posters are uh, instructions on how to vote. You check to, to make sure you're registered to vote at this particular location. If you have any questions, like you're not on the list, and you need to figure out where you are supposed to go vote, you you need additional instruction. You need water assistance with anything. The National Guard will help you. They are there to help and make sure that the elections uh, proceed uh, constitutionally, freely, fairly, openly, uh, openly, and um, and so that they also ensure that there are no threats against people showing up to to vote. So they are very, very much a part of um, the Bolivarian project and making sure that the elections remain, remain peaceful, free, fair, and open to all. And they assist with all kinds of things on election day. So for those of us in the States to see, you know, uh, a military, military personnel at a polling center, we would probably freak out about that. You know, for the Venezuelans, they have a completely different orientation uh, to their their military. It's a military of the people. So I just really wanted you to see that. Here is the uh, a voter showing up at the election, uh, the inside polling center. And this is where you sign in. Here he is signing in with his thumbprint and his cedula. So he is, you know, recognized by the, by the federal system with his thumbprint. That thumbprint opens the voting machine that he is going to use. So it identifies him and then it allows him to open the machine and vote. So this is how you vote, you know, in privacy. There's his ballot. I'm going to put it in the urn. And then when he's done, he's going to go to the Mesa and they're going to check his cedula. You can see here, well, this is maybe a little better. His cedula sitting on the table against his name. He signs that he voted. And then he also <clears throat> gives a fingerprint next to his sign, next to his name. So it's very clear, one person, one vote. And then when you're done, this gentleman is giving me the thumbs up that he's done. What historically happens is you take your pinky and you dip it in ink. It's a purplish lilac color. It's a very unique color created just for the CNE on election day. You dip your pinky in the in the ink before you walk out of the voting center so that it's very obvious you voted and you cannot re-enter to vote with your name or anybody else's. So it's a very, you know, it's a very clean protected process at the end of the day the each table within each polling center uploads the uh results of the day 
That's what we tried to do in El Salvador. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then the Wi-Fi Hello. went down. <laughs> yeah, they tried to do that to uh, in uh, how was it in, in Honduras, Simon, where they where the where you the website where you went to um, check your polling center that shut down uh, in the afternoon because so many people tend to vote uh, towards the end of the day throughout Latin. America. America. It's a it, it's it's a practice throughout Latin America. Uh, votes are all held on Sunday, and, and so it's a family day. People are home from work, and um, you know people will vote first thing in the morning. They'll go to church, have dinner with family, and then after that they'll go vote. So the first of the day and the end of the day are the two heaviest pushes, customarily throughout the region. And so, so this is printing out the receipt. And then, and again, this is at each table in each room in each polling center throughout the country. Then you take the receipt, and uh, and it is um, by um, hand. You have a chart in the room, and you compare it to what you know manually what happened and electronically what happened. And it's all usually pretty straightforward. The general public is allowed when the receipts are being, you know, uploaded and the results are being handwritten on the chart in the room, the general public is allowed to come in and witness all of that. So close doors and then, uh, you know, hidden. It's very, it's very transparent. And so with, with that, uh, something that ha happened in December of 2020, I was there in Venezuela as uh, an election observer for the National Assembly elections. And I those are held in uh, December of 15 as well. And Andrea, we took some National Lawyers Guild people with us on that mm. trip. Uh, among other organizations. And um, we met, let me find that picture. We met uh, the night before the elections in December. I organized a meeting with the opposition parties uh, to talk to them before election day. And uh, that I organized that and invited everyone from North America who was on the ground in, in Caracas to come to this meeting because we do not hear from those 42 parties that I mentioned earlier. Most people in North America, Europe too, I would say, only know of the Venezuelan opposition by Leopoldo Lopez, Juan Guaidó, Juan Guaido, that 1%, that 2% of that really violent, radical, right-wing, oligarchic class supported by the United States. Politically supported and financially supported, and I would argue militarily supported by the United States. That is one or two parties that the National Assembly met with earlier in the week. So in December of 2020, opposition parties, because we wanted to hear what we don't hear in the States. And I will tell you that meeting opened up with one of the gentlemen saying, we participate we are participating in the electoral process tomorrow because we believe the Venezuelan electoral process is free, fair, and transparent. That's from the opposition. He went on to say, we, you know, are very clear. They have a different vision for the country politically, economically, but they believe in constitutional change not the violent overthrow of the government. Well, constitutional change means participating in the electoral process. So this is something that the military and intelligence community 
does not want us to know. You do not hear about these people in the United States. You hear about that violent radical right that is now being inherited by Mashtaru. In the United States, she would be in prison, probably for treason, to be perfectly candid. And, you know, when you're calling for the overthrow of your government and, you know, militarily, yeah, you'd, be in the, you'd be in prison in the United States for that. So this, I just really want to give all of you some context as to what is brewing, you know, in the hemisphere coming, you know, coming from the north to Venezuela. We're all familiar with how intensively the United States has interfered with Venezuela since 1998 in many, many forms. Uh, media, economic, you know, is coming, 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 despite the fact that there were very successful meetings with, you know, a uh, cast of various political uh, philosophies in October in Barbados. So, um, It's not unlike, I would also say, it's not unlike uh, Mexico. And I guess I am particularly concerned about so much work and to watch this interference. It's, um, it, it's not a coincidence that the United States has created this anti-OMLO narrative several years ago, that they are using, attempting to use a drug cartel connection to discredit the president, it's the same. And that they are supporting, you know, an ex a very extreme right-wing candidate who also happens to be a woman in Mexico. There's a lot of parallels here. Um, Mexico will be voting on the second and then Venezuela later this year. So, you know, I'm gonna encourage all of you to go to Venezuela to as election observers or journalists to cover so that there are people on the ground who can counter whatever uh, is gonna be said, you know, in the North. So I think, I think that's it for me. If there's, maybe we should just open the floor to questions. Uh, question on Venezuela. Has, has the uh, has Maduro selected anybody in particular that he prefers uh, to replace him? And is Jorge Rodriguez? Rodriguez, uh huh. Jorge Rodriguez, yeah. Is he running? I'm sorry. Is he running? I, you know, that I don't know. I don't. I haven't heard. Uh, Jose Luis may know. I haven't heard <laughs> if there will be a, a, a PSUV candidate other than Maduro. Uh, the vice president is Delcy Rodriguez. Some of you may know her as the former foreign minister uh, uh, prior to Jorge Arriaza. Uh, she is, she and Jorge are, uh, Jorge Rodriguez are brother and sister. And uh, there is talk that she may succeed Maduro as the candidate. You know, there was one thing I wanted to screen share with you regarding Maduro. I don't know if I still can't, I'll, I'll put, I'll put the link in the, um, in the chat, it's a great video uh, from earlier in the week when he uh, arrived in Apure, uh, Estado Apure, which is close to the Colombian border. And he drove himself into town and the reception he got was phenomenal. And uh, again, something that you wouldn't see uh, in the United States. So I'll put that video in the chat. I don't, I have not heard of specific of a specific candidate succeeding Maduro. I think the intention is that he will run, I, but I would not be surprised if, uh, you know, if the candidate would not be, you know, the vice president. But again, they're just getting all of that um, outlined and we are expecting to hear something, you know, this Monday from Jorge Rodriguez uh, as representative of the National Assembly as to when the elections will be and and how that will all proceed. So in that regard, they're right on. They're you know they're really following exactly what was laid out in Barbados in in twenty in uh, October twenty twenty three, um, juxtaposed to how the United States is representing things right now.
Oh, um, I've heard that there were a lot of Venezuelans who have left the country recently, and I'm wondering if that's true, and if so, why? And generally, um, how Venezuela is doing in terms of the economy and human rights and things. Has Maduro been able to continue, um, you know, the um, Chavez's uh, you know, initiatives or or not? I get the impression he's he's not as charismatic as as Chavez was, but I, I'm wondering just how things are going. So um, let's talk about the migrants first, because this is this is fascinating to me to see what's happening and how it's being presented in the United States. And I will also say I spent, uh, I was in Venezuela the entire month of August of last year, but with the migrants, I mean, there's a historical context since the, uh, you know, sanctions were first in place. Well, March of 2015, when, uh, president Obama designated, um, Venezuela, a national security threat. And there's a lot of stuff that's unraveled since then. With this current wave of migrants, not a big percentage of this wave are Venezuelans who are already living in the exterior, the people who are already living outside, in the outside, coming. So they are already, they are part of that, you know, you can anywhere from four to seven million is, you know, the numbers, but but that tally has been really since 2015. So how many in the diaspora are currently entering the United States? And that's in a lot of them are already on the outside. And that is not clarified in the U.S. media. These are not new. These are people already on the outside coming. So uh, with, uh, I will, boy, I don't want to take up too much time because I think we could really, again, like, like with Andrew's talk, we could make this a full presentation. I've been going to Venezuela since the coup in 2002. And... Um, you know, the U.S. policy against Venezuela, once they started seeing, you know, the oil being used to invest in public, like it, like not a, unlike what the oil is being used for in Mexico to invest in public infrastructure, healthcare, education, invest in the people, the, the natural resource sovereignty. It's just been a full court press against Venezuela from every single direction. And um, one of the things that Maduro did, and Jose Luis, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say 2021, but maybe in 20, uh, they introduced the anti sanctions law. And what this has done it legalized the use of the u.s dollar the venezuelans have not pegged their economy to the u.s dollar but you can use u.s dollars as a trade as you know for trade for consumerism and trade and so that basically has created an informal method of foreign investment and i have watched this happen i i go to venezuela at least once a year and i have seen how this use of dollars went from, you know, be using it, you know, on the black market under the table and being completely illegal to now, you know, pretty much being able to buy anything with USD, including your SIM card at the local kiosk, you know, down the street from your hotel. What that has done is really uh, exploded consumerism for those people who have access to U.S. dollars. And it has also uh, promoted some pretty significant foreign investment. And I say that because when I was in um, 
there was a new shopping mall. And, and granted, this was on the east side of the city, which is the wealthy op opposition dominant east side, although there are pockets of Chavistas on that side of the city too. The Chavistas are principally on the west side. Um, there was a new shopping mall. It's nine stories. It looks like something you would see develop, you know, designed in Spain, Milan, or, or Italy. It has restaurants, movie theater, art, museums. Um, the roof is... Uh, is for for uh, live performing arts. Inside that mall are a lot of um, U.S. companies, McDonald's, Pizza Hut, Clark's Shoes, and then a lot of foreign uh, companies and Venezuelan companies as well. There was no way I could shop in that mall with U.S. dollars. I that mall. The other thing that I saw for the first time since 2002, I had to buy a card to use the metro system. And so uh, there's a lot of reinvestment in the electronics, the electronic ticketing, the card readers, and the cars themselves, and the metro stations. So there's some there's new public investment going on as well. I have to tell you, there was a point, one point several years ago, where I was told I could not use the metro system at all in Caracas. You know, there were no lights in the cars, no air conditioning, and the and the petty crime was significant because of the lack of lighting, et cetera. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, it was like, no, you're you know, go ahead and use it, just use it during daylight hours. And this last visit, no problem using the metro. 24 7 there are transportation transit police on the platforms uh the cars are all venezuela because i can't import the parts to keep a lot of infrastructure running and so they are learning reverse engineering and you know retooling and then uh parts and the subway system's phenomenal what's happened to that just in the last couple of years. So a lot of investment, but it has been spurred by this anti-sanctions law and the use of U.S. dollars. On the positive side, I spontaneously interfaced over the course of the month with four Venezuelans returning from the exterior because of the improvement of the domestic economy. People are returning home. And I'll tell you, they were really, really powerfully emotional conversations I had. They were all men. Um, they were all uh, probably under 40, certainly under 40. And um, really, they were so happy to be home. They were so happy to see the signs of economic improvement and growth. And they were so happy to return to Venezuela and escape the xenophobia in the exterior. So, so there are some some really encouraging things happening domestically with the current government. I mean, significantly enough for people to be returning home. And these were really power. I can't. They were really powerful, emotional conversations. People were so happy to be back in Venezuela with opportunity. I, I'd like to make a quick comment off of what um, what Terry just said. Sure. Um, a huge chunk of El Salvador's economy is remittances. So that's money that people who are living in the United States send back to their families in El Salvador. And when people leave El Salvador, if they're thinking of coming back, their families are saying, don't, don't. We, we need your money. We need you to keep sending mm -hmm. us money. Mm -hmm. So we're still seeing people leaving El Salvador and not coming back. Um, one additional thing I wanted to say about the sanctions and migrants is just to let people know, Juan Gonzalez, who's on uh, Democracy Now!, just did a study on the impact of sanctions on migration, and he focused on Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, and basically said that this increase that we're seeing in migration 
has to do with the sanctions that the U.S. is placing on those three countries. So um, if you're interested, you can follow. It's, I think, the Great Cities Institute is where he's, that he did this study. So um, we, I think we have one more question. Do we have any other questions? Can I just make a follow-up comment? Because it, sure. So, you know, Jose Luis's president has been very, very outspoken in Mexico and in the international community about uh, the use of unilateral coercive measure, measures and how they are driving um, migrants from Cuba uh, and Venezuela and other countries as well. And he is a, AMLO is a huge, huge anti-sanctions uh, spokesperson. And um, it's it's really wonderful to hear these comments coming, you know, from such an important leader in the Americas. Also regarding sanctions, and not just specific to those against Latin American countries, but sanctions in general, they're used to destroy the fabric of societies so that people flee and or overturn their government. A lot of people, and you can see in the chat, Jose Luis Sena, he did a really great podcast with Venezuela analysis on this. But one thing that's important to understand is that not everybody fleeing a country due to sanctions, we'll say Venezuela specifically, is against the government. The sanctions make life so difficult that you can't stay. So say, for instance, you know, you voted for Maduro. But you and you support the Chavista project and are going to continue doing that. You've got a two year old child that has a fever because of the sanctions. Venezuela cannot import certain medicines. What do you do to, you know, save your child's life? Do you sit there and hope some days off the black market or somebody, you know, is going to come in for you and your family? Or do you pack up? and walk across the border and go somewhere where you can buy medicine to save your child. Now that migrant is not anti-Maduro. That migrant is responding to an economic crisis that has created healthcare crisis, educational crisis, infrastructure, all of that. So just because someone leaves doesn't mean they're against their government. And, uh, you know, that doesn't always get talked about. So, but I will say, really, Amlo deserves a huge shout out for his his domestic and international comments on what's driving migration in the Americas right now. So, I think we have one more question that I see. You, do you still want to be here? Yeah. Do you still want to do the question? Here, Kim. Oh, Kim will give you the microphone. Hmm. Actually, I wanted to ask about um, Kelly. I thought he instituted bitcoins. Is that still true? Yep. <laughs> it's just idiotic. <laughs> <laughs> so, the government is idiotic. One of the people I work with when I got back from El Salvador said, I heard the Bitcoin weirdo once. <laughs> <laughs> he did institute Bitcoin. And um, mm -hmm. It was a spectacular failure. It, the average person is not going to be able to use Bitcoin. And, and when they instituted it, I think they gave everybody $30 of Bitcoin. And <laughs> it's, just, it's just not workable at all. Um, yes, he did, he did make Bitcoin an official currency of El Salvador. We actually, our last day in El Salvador, we went to a beach that's known as Bitcoin Beach because it's one of the first places where Bitcoin was instituted. And there was a little stand that sold beer and wine, water, stuff like that. And they took Bitcoin and they actually, I think, uh, I think they told me the, the person who was running the stand was arrested. So um, it's, it's out there, but it is just not used. Do they take cash? They took cash too, yes. <laughs> So I think we're going to end now, and I want to just thank Terry, Jose, and Andrea. 
I have learned a tremendous amount, and I hope all of you do too. It's really, and maybe you all want to think about going to Mexico and Venezuela when the election is yeah. coming. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you, Andrea and Jose Luis. It was really great sharing the, the morning with you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.